Hi, I'm Kathleen Malona. I'm a senior at Hope College. I am a chemistry major. And um, I'm just really excited to be with you guys today. We've just heard a lot of stories that can elicit a lot of emotions. But the ones that I found to be the most productive, surprisingly, have been anger and rage. Because rage and anger show that there's an intrinsic value inside of you that's been violated when you see something that's inconsistent with that value. So as you're listening to these stories, I, we don't really want pity, we don't really want sadness, we want rage that turns towards action. Um, and we are so honored to hear stories, and that's one of the things that I've been so empowered to see students use, is what we have as our stories, what we have our experiences. And what our hope is is these stories would elicit an action and a change. Um, um, before I introduce the panelists, I also want to talk a little bit about how these experiences that students are feeling are an after effect of a bigger, wider spread problem. Yeah, you guys can sit down. Um, the bigger problem is that Hope College was not created for students of color. It's not created for women. It was not created to be the perfect environment for them to, to flourish. It was just the people who were designing, the people who were in administration, it just wasn't created for us. So these stories, instead of viewing them as individual um, problems to address, view it as symptoms of a deeper issue that there needs to be a widespread systematic change. And I know that change can be scary, and change can mean losing power that was once distributed to some people and giving it to others. It might mean that the way decisions are made may look different. It might mean that you're not the front at the table, and it may mean that your voice is not the loudest. But that's what we're looking for, and this is what these stories tell, is that there is a systematic problem that is widespread, and not everyone has the same experience, not everyone has the same story. But the root is systematic. The root is that it was not, hope was not created for me, it was not created for us. The people, students of color, LGBTQ, poor, first generation students. So, on that beautiful note, I wanna just remind us that we can't change the problem like our speaker just said on Monday, Dr. DeGruy, we cannot change something we're not willing to look at, not looking to address, that we're not willing to be challenged by. So, I hope you're looking and listening. So, our panelists, Kendall Collins Riley, Becky Mises, Marco Pianera, and Hannah Bard. For the next 30 minutes, we'll be answering a few pre-selected questions, and we'll have 10 minutes at the end for questions as well. So, panelists, um, can you guys talk briefly about, just give your name, your major, typical, and then also, what leadership positions do you hold at Hope College? <coughs> And why did you decide to become a leader? Um, like Kathleen said, my name is Kendall Collins Riley. I'm the president of Last Union at Hope. Um, I'm a communication major with an Asian studies minor. And I think that becoming president was simply a part of a line of succession. I've been involved with Black Student Union since I was a freshman. I started off under um, Alexis Rivers as a trustee slash PR person then under Carissa as a historian, then under Yordano Stesi as um, vice president. And it was only natural that I take up leadership next because it's something that I've put four years of passion work into. I am Rebecca Macias Cuero. Um, I am a junior social work major and I'm involved, I'm one of the student directors for students teaching and empowering peers. And I am a second year RA for Emmaus as well as a member of the 95 Stories team. Um, for me, actually a lot of the reasons I wanted to get involved in leadership positions had to do with the pressure that I felt coming into Hope feeling like I had to prove myself. And I started just seeing things around me that, that weren't, didn't, like Kathleen was saying, didn't line up with what I believed a just institution should be. And so that's kind of what propelled me into some of these positions. Hello. Uh, hi everybody, my name is Michael Panetta. Uh, I'm a sophomore at Hope College and I'm pursuing a business degree and a jazz studies minor. Um, on campus, I am a campus campaign coordinator for Teach for America, which basically means I'm, I'm recruiting seniors for a two-year teaching position uh, as soon as they graduate. I work with Hope College Concert Series as a core member 
And I also support, I'm an ally of the 95 Stories team, and I support me and every MSO, uh, multicultural student organization. And I, I decided to become a leader because uh, I naturally you know, feel and I've always tried to develop these natural skill sets that kind of allow me to connect with people on a much deeper, deep, deep, wow, on a much deeper level uh, than if you're just like a member of something. You know, when you're a leader, it's not telling people what to do, but it's kind of grabbing hold of that rope with them and telling them the way to go and walking and standing with them. So that's kind of why I became a leader. Thanks, Michael. Hi, I'm Hannah Baird. Um, I'm a junior, majoring in business and economics. Um, some leadership positions that I hold, and um, I'm an RA for a residential life, and then I'm on Team Z for our worship teams and chapel band. And um, I'm gonna speak mainly to the worship team aspect of why I chose um, a position of leadership. Uh, I recognized last year um, that we had a chapel team that was representative of only one aspect of what the body of Christ looks like. Um, and if we were to say that chapel team is that medium for worship for individuals, um, then we have to have individuals up there that are representative of every walk of life. And um, so that's mainly the reason I chose that. Wonderful. Thanks, guys. Um, what is the mission and impact or the successes and, successes and outcomes of the organization you are leading? Um, I'll start with Black Student Union. Our overall mission and goal is to build strength through unity across Hope Camp Hope's campus and within the Holland community. And the execution of that started off very rocky, as far as I um, know prior to my coming here in 2015. And since then, we have been on a steady upward climb to not only build the black community at Hope College and give them a safe space to express themselves and be unapologetically and unabashedly black, we are cultivating a community where students of all, from all walks of life can come and ask questions that they feel they, they would never be able to in a public setting because there is a stigma attached to ignorance. There's a stigma attached to not knowing something because people expect you to know everything and know nothing at the same time. So within the organization, we've strive to create this community and build this place where we can cater to Hope's campus and Hope's campus can in turn reciprocate that same care and affection and love for us. Thanks, Kim. Um, I'll speak to 95 Stories. So Hope College has a statement that says that we're committed to the concept of equal rights. We don't have a statement that says we are committed to equal rights. And so a lot of what 95 is seeking to do is to have us to have Hope College reflect a commitment to equal rights. So that being students of color, LGBT students, being able to be given the same voice and the same attention that everybody else is. And so we have eight different proposals that include things like more representation in faculty, inclusive housing for trans and non-binary students, removing the statement, the human sexuality statement, and other stuff like that. Um, so I'll speak on Teach for America. Uh, I know it, this is an external organization that is just basically uh, has a presence here on Hope College, but the basic mission and outcome of it is that they drive forward under the premise that there is an extreme problem of educational inequity that we face here in America, and is it, it is a systematic problem as well as racism and marginalization and discrimination in America. And basically, through working with the program, I have learned very, very quickly and very shockingly that a lot of what goes on and the disconnect that exists in classrooms are actually due to that racial barrier. A lot of the times it's low income communities that have these sorts of problems and a lot of the times these uh, students that, you know, the, the huge percentages and all the numbers that we work with, most of those students that we talk about and we inform kids at Hope College about are students of color or are multinational students. So basically, you know, the outcomes and the missions are to connect with people here on campus, let them know what's going on, and also tie in that aspect of diversity and you know the racial barriers that exist in the educational system uh, here in America. Um, I'll talk about residential life then. Um, I think the mission of residential life uh, is to foster the sense of belonging and when, in residents when they come to Hope and when they're living in um, those residential communities, which are cottages, apartments, and residential halls. And, but the question is, how do you do that in practice when you have residents um, from every walk of life and from different backgrounds, from different races, from different religions? And so I think our goal um, and what we strive to do mainly um, is to make every single student feel like they 
have a spot at Hope that they have people that know them and people that they can trust and be open around. And what do you guys feel most proud of in your leadership role and the opportunities you've obtained at Hope? What you've done, what you've seen change? Good. Um, back to BSU, yes. Um, I think the, the pride that I hold for the organization stems from the people within it. Um, we are all different. We are all various shades, various backgrounds, various degrees um, that we're seeking at this institution. Uh, we're all bound here for similar reasons or very different reasons, but the fabric of the community is built from hundreds of beautiful faces and the pride that I feel for this organization stems from the fact that we all man manage to come under, come into one space and uplift and support and provide a safe space and a loving community for one another despite the fact that this campus itself may not always give us the same thing. And when we feel that tension, when we feel that fear, when we feel that anxiety and sometimes even become depressed by the environment and climate that we have to live in, that we have to edu become educated in, um, we can come back to one another and we can pat each other on the back, lift each other up, and support each other in ways which we do not receive on, in many other places on this campus. I have very similar thoughts. Um, I think that I'm most proud of the fact that we as a group are a group of people that are advocating for each other because we have a lot of very different people on our team. For 95 stories. For 95 stories, correct. Um, and I, I think it's a really beautiful thing that we can speak to what we need. Um, in 95, we're, like, all of our proposals were created taking into account the people that would impact. Um, and that it does impact that we don't have these protections for students. And so I'm proud of the diversity and I'm proud of the unity that comes with all sorts of different people coming together fighting for a common cause. So with Teach for America, um, what I'm really most proud about, about being in this leadership role is kind of expanding on that idea of connecting with people. But uh, the idea of going to an inner city school to teach for two years really means that you need to have a passion to be able to connect people that don't necessarily look like you, think like you, haven't been through what you've been through. And it's, it's a really hard barrier to cross. You know? So I'm proud that I'm able to actually connect with these people. And, talk to those people who really, really want to learn. And that's kind of what I'm gonna expand on in the further portion of this panel. But, and also, you know, the opportunities that I've gotten hope, I'm um, coming from Honduras. So I lived there for five years. Uh, I, I was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, lived there for 12. So it's a real, uh, you know, kind of like an amalgam of culture and so many different things that have blended me into the person that I am today. And I'm very, 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 grateful for the, all the opportunities. For those of you who know me know that music is everything to me. It is the biggest part of my life. So the musical opportunities that I've had at Hope as well are just phenomenal. You know, I never would have been able to do the things I'm doing here without the support and all the you know, experiences that have popped up here at Hope. Uh, what I'm most proud of for worship team, um, I think it was the initial courage it took to say um, in my interview for it and that I recognize that this isn't what the body of Christ is supposed to look like. This isn't what it looks like in practice um, and it isn't what we should continue to perpetuate um, as a worship team. And as a whole, I'm proud of them for taking that into account and taking into account and that there are different styles of worship and introducing those throughout this year. Thank you guys. Okay. So none of the good stuff. I'm just kidding. Um, how would you describe the state of experience for students of color at Hope? And what would be an ideal, equitable, and inclusive campus look like? Um, we talked about a few key words and also um, reminding that we've discussed this and kind of on the same page that the experiences are an after effect of the system and the fact that it wasn't created for students who look like us. And this is why across the board in those videos, there's very um, consistent responses and consistent feeling of isolation that we'll talk about um, as a panel. So how would you describe the state of experience for students of color at Hope? Um, and what would be an ideal, equitable, and inclusive campus? OK, yeah, I can, I can start this one off. Um, so the, the, how would I describe the state of experience for students of color at Hope? Uh, we were kind of talking about some action words, one specific word, and the word that I kind of developed on was the idea of disconnected. 
right? So I've heard too many stories and witnessed a lot of different experiences that kind of fall under that adjective of people can't transcend whether it be their cultural upbringings, whether, whether it be what they're looking at in the classroom, it's very hard for people to kind of just expose everything that they are and fight off this idea between, this constant battle between an image of equity and actual equity. You know, the idea between you know, having students of color all across campus and accepting, developing, and working with the cultures that they bring, the mentalities that they bring, and the experiences that they bring. And when I talk about disconnected, I mainly think, uh, you know, a lot of the time the student body, but as you will hear with some other experiences, a lot of it is in administration, and a lot of it is in student organizations as well. So that's kind of my piece. So what I hear you saying is disconnected, one, like, students of color being disconnected from like the larger white majority at Hope, and also like the disconnect between the idea of diversity and inclusion and like actual equity and like doing what it takes. Was that? Yeah, that's correct. Cool. Awesome. Anyone else like that? I think the general state or experience for a student of color on Hope's campus, um, to give this a little bit of background, um, I'm adopted, so my parents are white, and I grew up in a white community. I was always the only person of color in my classes growing up, and the only person of color along with my brother um, at services for church. Um, coming to Hope, I still struggled with finding the sense that I belonged here, and I still struggled with transferring. Um, I. And I don't know a single student of color that I've spoken to and know um, that hasn't at some point in their whole career considered transferring to an institution that actively values diversity and inclusion. Because it's an easy thing to say that we value it and to put it on our website and to put it in our values and our morals. Um, but it's more difficult to put into practice and it's more difficult um, to actually say that we are are going after this and I think that looks like in practice and um, adding scholarships for students of color and um, to combat the scholarships that we have for legacy students when legacy students are mainly coming from white backgrounds and um, yeah I think that's all I have to say. Thanks. Uh, I think Taylor in the, the Minority Report documentary said it best. Um, people like the idea and the concept of diversity, but when it comes to actually doing groundwork and restructuring the institution from the top down, nobody really wants to do it. It's kind of like crickets. Everything just goes silent in the room. And when you pose that idea of, are we going to enact change? Are we going to make it so students of color feel like people intentionally want to understand them as people, rather than just have them around to say, we have a black person, we have our Asian, we have our Latinx student. Perfect. <laughs> when you look at the photos in the bookstore and on brochures, you see one that checks every single box, um, but you don't take into account their background, their experience. You don't know whether they're African or African American or Afro Caribbean or anything of the like or Afro Latino. Um, you don't take into consideration their gender identity, their sexual orientation, their socioeconomic background. There's levels to us as people. We are a multi-dimensional campus. Mm -hmm. And until we actively acknowledge and recognize that, we're not going to be able to do anything but take pictures. I don't know how to follow up. Um, I was told when I came to Hope as a freshman, like in, within the first couple weeks, was, oh, you're one of those people that's only here because you're a person of color. And I think that that's the thing that I think has resonated. I think a lot of students on campus do feel very overlooked as a whole person. So by that I mean, I think that I am either branded as a person of color or as an LGBT person, and that's my entire identity is focused solely on this one part, or I'm just a student and those identities are overlooked and I'm just like everybody else. And I want to be celebrated as a first generation immigrant, Latina, LGBT student. I want all of me to be celebrated. I don't want just the things that I do or just one label to be what defines me. Thank you. Um, I want to add a little bit to that too. Um, 
One thing that I've noticed is that we like having the numbers, but we don't really like, so when I say numbers, I mean numbers of students of color, LGBTQ students, and showing them off is like, look how diverse we are. We don't really give them positions of influence to actually change the, the system or the organization that they're in. Um, and that's what I've been noticing is that when it comes to that like dedication to diversity is you look around and maybe you're a little uncomfortable, but there's no people of color, but would you hire a person of color or recruit a student that you know will change everything about how your organization looks? Will you recruit a person, a professor for your um, department that will change the way it flows? Will you let them be the department chair? Or do you just want a number, a person of color to fill a body? And that's what it feels like, is that even when we're recruited for things and it just seems like you just want the numbers because um, we'll talk about some experiences later, it just feels like you want my face on a poster, you want to get the money that comes maybe from students of color coming to hope, but there's not really desire to see things change, to let go of the reins and to let a person speak for themselves and have influence over the organization and the department. Yeah, please. Uh, you just said something that the light bulb went. Um, in positions of leadership at Hope, you start to become very familiar with how things operate and who's doing what and who works where. And when you look at the, for instance, the Student Life Office, which is part, which is um, coupled with the Center for Diversity and Inclusion, you look at one side of the room and there's there's me, there's other members of LSO and Hoppe and BSU and the African Society, and then you look at the other side of the room and there's white students on SAC, and there's very little crossover except for the few safe minorities that they've just strategically chosen for positions in higher up places. BSU, LSO, SAC, and the African Society do not get the same privilege nor the same resources that groups like SAC do. And when you divide us and then pick and choose who you'd like in those positions, who checks your diversity box but does not disrupt the status quo and the way you operate things, you further the problem. And I think another thing to add, oh wait, yes, Kendall, amen. Um, another thing to add to that is that maybe it's subconscious, but it also feels like people who are movers and shakers don't really want to just be a person in the corner of the room who's just sitting there. They want positions of influence because they have the leadership supposed to do that. So I think there's also a problem of like, I won't just be in your poster. You might have seen my face around campus, I've stopped doing that. But I don't want to just be on a poster, I want to influence, I want to make changes, I want to have my voice heard, and I don't want to just be a side of the room. So if you want to recruit me to just be a person in the corner of the room, like that's just not going to work for me. Um, all right, and um, feel free to add anything else and interrupt me anytime. Um, so what do you feel are the greatest barriers students of color face at Hope? Social, cultural, academic, financial, spiritual, health-wise. Can you guys, you can share anecdotes, you can talk about systematic things that you felt. Um, feel free to just be honest. Okay, yeah, so hop on this one. I'd actually like to share an anecdote, something that happened to me just yesterday, actually. Um, so I went to see Eric Johnson live in Grand Rapids. How many of you know who that is? Just out of curiosity. Oh wow, great, awesome. Okay, cool, Eric Johnson, just mind-melting guitarist, really old school. And uh, so the, the, the concert was in Grand Rapids in, in a venue called The Intersection. And I went with my girlfriend and her father, and we're all Latinos of Puerto Rican, Mexican, and Honduran culture, respectively. Um, so when we get to the venue, and I saw something that I'm used to seeing all the time, it's a predominantly white group of people who bought these tickets, you know, been able to get to the concert in, in a timely fashion. And so we kind of picked out our seats, we kind of sat down in the middle row, and we noticed that this group in front of us was two gentlemen and a young boy. And the second we sat down, one of the gentlemen looks at us and they're like, hey, guys, this is the next big thing coming. And he points to the young boy, he's like, this is a child prodigy, 12 years old, can shred. And he pulls out his phone, pulls up YouTube, and starts showing us these videos, and I was honestly, I was dumbfounded. This kid could shred. When I say he should shred, he could shred. It was not a lie. So we were all musicians, we all started talking about that. We were like, wow, what's up? And we started networking a little bit, right? So after some brief time of just speaking and like telling a little bit about our backgrounds, um, the father, he gets up, go, go buys a beer. And then the boy, 
he kind of just turns around, he kind of glances at us a little bit, and he was still with this other gentleman. And then the boy, so confidently, he looks at us, he looks at us and says, Mexicans? Uh, right? And I was like, huh, you know, where have I heard this before? Let me, let me just think about it. Where, where have I heard this before? It's a whole college, you know? And, but the thing is, there are two parts to this anecdote, two reasons why I'm telling you this story. So first of all, the guy next to him, he, he hits us with one of these, he's like, <laughs> and we're like, okay. We took a moment, and I said, no. And my girlfriend's father, my girlfriend, they were like, no. Calmly, very calmly. And that's one of the portions of this anecdote that I think is really important. It is the approach to that sort of situation, right? I've heard it before on Hope College. You're Mexican, right? Oh, are your parents back in Mexico? Oh, you're from Mexico, right? All of it, I've heard it before. <clears throat> See, but who is asking me this? A 12-year-old boy. And it is somewhat ignorant, but I, I acknowledge the fact that he's uneducated. Maybe his upbringing, maybe his school system has not taught him that there are other Latin nationalities other than Mexican. And that's fine. I've acknowledged that my entire life, and I've had to deal with it. So I calmly said, no, I'm Honduran. Do you know where that is? And he said, no. So I took out my phone, took out a map, and showed him. We're the heart of Central America, man. Right there. Right there. Pointed to it. Right there. And... I saw one thing in this kid's eyes that differentiated a 12-year-old boy from a lot of the kids at Hope College that I've talked to. You know what that was? It was the interest to learn. This kid's eyes, he, it lit up. he was taking all the information that I was giving him in, right? And that is kind of, again, just connecting that to what I'm saying here. It is one of the barriers that I've noticed with that disconnection. It's the lack of interest to learn about cultures. When people ask you, do they really want to know? Or are they just trying to pass that question to the side so they can, you know, get to that surface level? Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Pass. Boom. You know, and again, like, that, that's one of the barriers. It's one of my greatest barriers, uh, obviously. But at the same time, it's something that, just from a personal experience, I have to say, one thing is very important. It is the approach to that sort of situation. There are a lot of different approaches. So if somebody at Hope College comes up to me and says, hey, are you Mexican? Or you're Mexican? I will look and see them now as a 12-year-old boy. I will treat them and see them as a 12-year-old boy. That makes sense. The thing is, the students at Hope College were college students, right? At this point in their lives, I would have hoped that they would have developed some sort of different approach to that question. Hey, what is your nationality? Instead of making the assumptions. And I think that was, that was said in the you know, 95 Stories video. Uh, about the, the the making of assumptions, but definitely that is probably one of the greatest barriers right. that I have yeah. seen that that, that lack of awesome. you know knowledge. And with our um, last like one or two minutes, um, does anyone else want to share? About, yeah, Kendall. Um, you you mentioned safety at the very end, and that wasn't on the sheet, and that the the tidal wave of things in my mind. Um, at the end of the Minority Report documentary, I directed um, and wrote the documentary uh, and all that fun stuff as a communication student. And um, there were stories in there that I had not heard before until I was standing behind the camera in the multicultural lounge listening to them. And the fact that the safety of students of color is so easily compromised on this campus is abysmal and appalling. Um, the fact that during the election season, as mentioned in the 95 Stories documentaries, Scott Hall was being threatened. They were saying on Yik Yak, they were gonna build a wall around Scott. People came up to students of color in Phelps and said, we're coming for you tonight. You better lock your doors. Threats, verbal threats, face-to-face -face interactions, interpersonal communication across cultures, literally my entire study. Um, the gall of some of these people on this campus, the fact that you can comfortably, within the confines of a private institution that prides itself on building global students, you can say to another student, not knowing anything about them, I'm coming for you tonight, just based off of the fact that your president got elected, and not even with the popular vote, based on the fact that your president has emboldened an entire group of people to feel that they are superior in any way, shape, or form. That's not what we're on this campus to learn. That's not what this institution is about. Christians would never. If you love your God the way you say you do, you would never. And if you saw that and you love your God the way you say you do, and you follow Jesus the way you say you do, you would never allow that to go down in public in front of you. It is a call to action. Christ calls us to act. Faith without works is dead. We can praise all we want in chapel, but if we don't do anything, 
if students can get run down and targeted by pickup trucks. If students can have their safety in a building compromised because they wanted to have a cultural experience their first year of college. If students feel unsafe walking around this campus the day after the election. I walked around campus with a baseball bat in my backpack because I'm from Chicago and I wanted somebody to try me. My mother and father said all it takes is one swing. If somebody compromises your safety, you come right back for them. We'll find you somewhere else to go. The fact that you will sit on this campus and allow our safety to be compromised, the fact that campus safety has two, I believe? Two, I think it's actually two. Two officers of color. Thanks, Steve. Three? I think so. Three, three officers of color. Upgrade. And only one. <laughs> Okay. And one of them has made a conscious effort to come and contact all the multicultural student organizations and make sure that they are doing their job and achieving their goals of keeping this a safe place for all of us. Only one. Where, where's all this action? We talk a lot, talk about diversity. We talk a lot, talk about keeping students safe. We talk a lot, talk about this being a God-fearing community. There is no God in that kind of action. There is no God in the fact that we walk around this campus afraid sometimes. There is no God when we're being consistently ignored in classrooms and on boards in student organizations in this very building. Where's the action? There's not much left to say after that. Um, we're gonna move on to audience questions. Um, so one of the things, one of the most recent things, by the way, thank you to all of you guys. Like that was insane. A round of applause for us. All right. Um, one of uh, one recent event that happened um, in my uh, residential hall, Cook Hall, um, was uh, one of the like. Um, foundational like institutions of Hope College, which is campus safety, you know, like meant to keep us safe, like it's in the description, um, was targeted, not in a way of like uh, socially attacking them in general, but uh, I had found a um, mock poster that was posted up on uh, one of the main doors of the stairwells uh, in Cook that was directed to uh, Al Rios, which is one of the campus safety officers, um, because uh, he had uh, made a poster that introduced him as a campus safety officer to welcome him into Hope College. Um, and uh, Al, uh, he's also Latino, and he um, had posted, in, he, he had put in his poster that um, he, you know, can't wait to like meet so many students. And when I saw that, I was like, this is great. But then I saw that mob poster that says, if you see uh, any immigrants, please call ICE. Um, if, yeah, uh, if you see me, uh, also call ICE. Um, vote, uh, build that wall, also, uh, call ice, I, I don't know, but it was it was attacking uh, and I took a picture of it just because I feel like events and like things like this need to be called out more. Um, however, again, it goes again, it goes without saying that I had a lot of people confront me about that good and bad. A lot of people are like, oh, just take it as a joke because it was a joke. Um, this is an, this is not a joke. <laughs> this is this is not funny because this is someone that is out here to um, protect us like physically in, in any way to protect us. And um, I just want to hear uh, some feedback on, on kind of things and events like that and how to also um, confront, confront them. So you're talking about feedback on that specific event and like similar events? As Event, similar events though. And then also how to combat things that are 
often claim just to be a joke and a humorous to some people. Yeah. Yeah, correct. I found the poster. Yeah. Um, so my thought on this, I saw this and got angry and then was mentioning it to one of my professors, showed it to her and almost broke down crying. Um, because you might, like whoever created this might think it's a joke, but the reality is you're doing this intentionally, like you're going out of your way to create something that's going to make somebody feel unsafe. That's not acceptable. And that should be treated as, it's 150% unacceptable and we should not treat something like that as a joke. And there should be consequences and there, sh there should be an investigation and these things need to be, the reality that like students are literally during the election for instance, people not leaving their rooms because they were afraid. This triggers all the other experiences we've had where we've been made to feel unsafe, where we've been made to feel unwanted, all these things. So I think we just need to take it as seriously as we would any other inc incident of discrimination, harassment, anything of that sort. Like these things change students' lives. I think there's also um, a power to the fact that the people who are making the judicial reviews and who they answer to are white men and white women as well. And I think that there's a power in that who is, um, who are they answering to? And I think that that is a motivator. They know that maybe they'll be given, there is a source of empathy when you look like the person who is um, judicially reviewing you. And I think that that also comes to systematic issues of who's in power, who gets to decide, and why do they feel comfortable doing that? And why is that something that they feel that they can do comfortably on Hope's campus? And what is it about this campus that makes them feel that comfortable? And I think a lot of it has to be who has the final say and who has the power. And I think that that's... Hey, so I can contest that poster. They found it in Cook Hall and in Lichty. I personally took a picture of it and I sent it to my RD. I sent it to the compliance coordinator at Hope College. They told me there was being an investigation done. Now the thing that I'm thinking about is, somebody took the time yeah. to walk around. Either walk around or they have some little like secret like, underground you know, like thing going on. They, they both printed it in both of those dorms or somebody walked around campus and posted it up. I'm just saying, like, people have this type of time on their hands. Why don't they, like, read a book or something? Yeah. There's, something there's something productive. That's what I'm saying. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I had a quick comment. I'm sorry, Dr. Doshi. Um, uh, comment number one, there are babies being ripped out of their mother's arms at the border. This is not a joke. Nor will it ever be humorous. Um, there are children missing uh, that they have no record of, no account for it. That's not a joke. It will never be. Um, number two, there's a lot of people on Hope that have real strong Twitter fingers, but when it comes time to face to face, they'll never. Another one. They they would never come up to Officer Rios and say those things to his face, jeopardize their education, jeopardize their scholarships, tuition, their status on campus, become a pariah in their own community because people feel slightly they feel a healthy amount of Christian guilt to be associated with somebody who could do something like that. They would never do this in person. And the select few who have are emboldened by subtle acts of racism. They're saying, oh, we can get away with flyers, we can get away with social media posts, we can get away with this, that, and the other. I could probably do this in person and see not a single Title IX coordinator, not a single report filed against me. And it has happened on multiple occasions. It's happened in some of the biggest hope traditions we have, the pull. Mm -hmm. The sheer fact that people feel emboldened by subtle acts of racism and are constantly committing them. What, what is the campus doing? What is it about this climate, like Kathleen said, what is it about this campus as a whole that makes you feel so comfortable to violate the human rights of other people? Dr. Doshi. Thanks, Kendall. Um, hi, uh, so my name is Dr. Marissa Doshi. I am with the Department of Communication, uh, but I guess today I'm here wearing a different hat. Um, I'm also on the Gen Ed Revision Task Force, which is seeking to revise or 
look at and review um, the current gen ed curriculum. Um, in some of the uh, document, in some of in the documentaries that we watch, and some of the things that you guys have spoken about, um, you folks have spoken about. Um, I've heard a couple of things. Um, I've heard this idea of disconnect, right? Um, and that was referenced particularly in terms of the Eurocentrism of cultural heritage, um, and also in the surface level sort of global learning that is happening. These are directly related to um, ideas that we're tackling in Gen Ed. So I hear you, and I hear what you're saying, and I'm happy to take some of this back to the task force. But I guess I also wanted to open up and ask what else would you like me to take back to the task force in terms of the curriculum that should be taught to every Hope College student? Thank you. Yes, that um, Thank you so much, and I'm excited to see the effects of that, what ends up changing in regards to gen heads. Um, one thing that I've had a privilege of being a part of is the Diversity Training Institute, and I think those three go like through the five basic areas of cultural competency, identity, racism, systematic racism, social justice, and I feel like there's aspects, and this created by Miss Green, um, who like works really tirelessly to educate, and I've seen people go through those like practical and like really important educational aspects that I think would be really integral. So even making that diversity training institute a course that's like required might be a good education because I feel like you can theoretically learn and read a book, but to really apply it to yourself and see how you work in the system and perpetuate it are like two very different things. So I think that that would be a suggestion I have. We talked about this a little bit as we were discussing it yesterday, but new faculty have to do a mandatory orientation. There's, it should also be mandatory to do training on diversity because who the material is coming from impacts what the material is a lot. So you might be teaching, I don't know, if it's a cultural heritage class, you might be using African literature, but if you're not somebody who truly appreciates the culture or who is really going to be able to speak into the beauty of it, are you going to be just reading from a text and make your students think that it's completely dry? Mm -hmm. So I think we need to have, it needs to be not just students learning these things, but faculty really need to be pushed. To, this needs to be mandatory. I, as a student, have had a really great experience with my department um, because all my professors, it's social work, so they're all very aware of issues of race. And I had a really unique experience in that as a first semester freshman, I had four women of color as professors. That doesn't happen to anybody, but that had a huge impact on me because I was able to look, I had four women that I could look up to and I could be like, okay, I could be a professor. I could be a social worker, I could be these things, I could be an educator, because I had somebody who looked like me, who had at least a piece of my experience, who was standing up there and had so much wisdom. So, I think it, yeah, I'm really excited to see that though. I really do think that having it be part of the core curriculum can make a huge difference, because otherwise, frankly, you could go four years at home having maybe interacted with one person of color once in a class, and one other thing I want to add to that is what two things. One that like you use I keep I keep finding for her. Miss Green like spent years and years and years of her life figuring out best practices for departments, for professors, for administrators. And that is a resource that is available and that should be used. And so I think often like questions can be pointed, this is not like at you, but um, questions can be pointed at students that we've we're not trained. I didn't come here trained to do diversity work. Like, I came here to be a student and to learn. And so when there's a department, one, that's underfunded, but their job, and she's been trained to, and just like obviously respecting her time and that she does a lot, but I think that's a resource that is underused. Um, and two, what I love, Dr. Doshi, is that you use your influence and the sphere of influence you have to make changes. And so what I'm looking for is just looking, what department are you on, what committee are you on, and how can you make it, one, look more like the kingdom of God, and make it more just, equitable, make it more diverse. And I think that that might mean taking a step back and amplifying someone else's voice, and that might mean advocating for hiring practices, and that have been suggested by Ms. Green, or that you know our best practices. Um, and I think that's just a suggestion. So I appreciate you using your sphere of influence, because we all have one. Any more questions? Thank you guys for your response. Hi, what would you say to high school students of color who desire to have a BSU? 
but they have fear of being accused of them starting a segregated group for black students or students of color. Um, we recently had a speaker on Monday, um, Dr. Joy DeGru, um, who spoke about post-traumatic slave syndrome and the experiences of various minority groups in, within the United States. And during our dinner with her, um, the idea of having multicultural student organizations came up. And as she said, sometimes spaces just need to be black. Sometimes we just need that space. We need that sense of comfort. We need that sense of familiarity. Um, we are often accused of Phelps Scholars being the segregated program. Phelps Scholars doesn't segregate anyone. Right. Phelps Scholars was home for me freshman year and the sole reason I did not transfer schools. Phelps Scholars doesn't keep people out. BSU does not exclude anybody who is not black. It is an, both are open communities dedicated to the idea that this is a space for the people in the name, but you can come into as long as you respect that space. You maintain rapport and you respect that space. Once disrespect is enacted, you gotta go. But as long as you come into that space and you acknowledge this is where we're safe, this is where we're loved, this is where we're cared for, this is where we're kept, this is where we trade information, this is how we keep our heads above water at an institution like this. That is when you are allowed within the space. That is when the space doesn't become segregated to you. It becomes necessary. Just because you think it's segregated doesn't mean that it's not necessary. You're just not up to the standard. I think also what you'll see is that retention comes up higher, like students do better when they have that space to respond. Like that's what we've been fighting, and she's been fighting leading that fight really hard to have a multicultural student lounge. And so I think there's plenty of statistics and things you could pull to see how students actually do better, perform better when they have that space where they can be completely and unapologetically themselves. And so I think that the stats and the science is behind you and saying that it is proven that they will do better when they have that space to empower one another and like make changes. So. Thank you so much. I don't have a question. Maybe this is just a comment. But I love like everything that you're, you guys are doing up there. I mean, I applaud you. Um, it's really vital in this environment. But I think that you should get a bigger platform than just this room because everybody you're talking to isn't, isn't in this room right now. So I just think that if you guys got that platform, um, it'll do a lot better um, just to get that the word out there. Thank you for that. I believe this is being recorded as well. So hopefully people who are not in this room will be able to see this video and be able to obtain the information. Hey James, thanks so much for that, man. And like again, like personally on a personal note, I'm I'm about that understanding and that intention to understand. So I personally just want to thank each and every one of you because each and every one of you walked into this room and thought, hey, their opinions might differ from mine and that's okay. I'm here to learn. That's it. And that's what I believe is really, really necessary. Hope to campus, hope administration, everything, the world in general. But each and every one of you said, I'm here to learn. You might have heard something you didn't like, but you're not taking it as offense. You're listening and you're listening to experiences that aren't yours and that's something super, super important for understanding. So thank you, thank you everyone. That's my best friend. Hey. <laughs> and Steven, did you have a question? Yeah, I want, ooh, that's long. Um, I wanted to respond to um, the question earlier about the BSU. So you're here, um, uh, you're in high school right now. If I could give any suggestion, connect with people who, ad who will help you advocate on your behalf. Because we're stronger as people who are united. Um, you're here right now. Please connect to, to the presidents of BSU here. Please connect to people in your neighborhood or in your area who can help you um, develop yourself as an individual and as a community. Um, so that, that's just my suggestion. Oh, just to attest to Stephen's point, BSU would not be afloat without Vanessa Green. BSU would not be afloat without Dr. Gerald Griffin. Dr. Kendra Parker, Dr. Temple Smith, we would not exist. We would not thrive on this campus if it were not for these wonderful black people. They advocate for us on a regular basis. They push for us. They make this space what it is for us. 
So once you find those people that are willing to put themselves in harm's way, to put themselves in the line of fire for your safety and your benefit and your education, that is when you have found the people who will help you propel your organization to what it needs to be. I love that. Like, you're just saying, like, well, are you willing to put yourself in the line of fire to see change? Are you willing for your voice, and this is specifically talking to like white cisgender Christian men and women, but are you willing to let your voice be diminished to amplify other people's voices? And that's kind of what the call, in my opinion, is. Is that it's not just add a little diversity in on the side. Mm -hmm. It's sacrificing your own voice and your own influence and amplifying voices that make the community a better place and make a more just, equitable community. Yeah, uh, um, uh, yeah, I would just like to, to follow up with that and say, uh, uh, my question is, would you say that more conversation is always better? Uh, just simply yes or no, or uh, I guess we can talk about that, but um, I'd follow up as well. Hey man, uh, what's your name? My name is uh, Scott. All right, cool, thanks Scott. That's a really good question. In my opinion, um, I think more conversation can be better, but it depends under the light that it's you know achieved. You know what I'm saying? Because a conversation is a mutual thing, and it requires that mutual you know that, that again going back to that want of, to understand that other person, right? And it is very important for both people to take their culture, put it to one side take what they want to learn and throw that forward. And especially to control your emotions, you know what I'm saying? Like it's important to be patient, it's important to you know, understand that some people just don't know things, some people are oblivious, some people are ignorant. Those, the more conversations you have, that's what you're gonna realize, you know? There are people that are ignorant, there are people that are not. There are people that want to learn, there are people that don't. So I, I, I would say definitely more conversation is better, but it really depends on what the intention of the conversation is. Yeah, and I think that's why I said uh, conversation as opposed to debate. Um, yeah. um, kind of from a different lens. I love to talk. Like, I would literally get kicked out of my grandparents' house because I talked too much when I was a toddler and they couldn't handle it. Um, I'm not joking. But at the same time, I think talk can be cheap because I think we have a campus community that loves the idea of dialogue and the idea of conversation, and we're not very comfortable with the idea of change. So. I would love to sit and talk, but at the end of the day, if that conversation isn't leading to anything but more conversation, yeah. we have a problem. Right. Yeah. And you'll notice that when students start to do like activism and actually make change, that's when we really start talking about dialogue. Um, like I remember when we had, um, like, I just that it's like almost like they're seen as opposites, and that. It's like when you sense change, like wait, 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 let's talk about it, let's talk about it, let's talk about it. So it's almost as like a gas, to like I mean as um, a break on change. And so I think that when you talk about more conversation, it's important to assess why are we talking? Is it because I sense something's changing and I want to remain in control? Or is it because I'm having a conversation about how can we actually make change? Like a strategic conversation with um, goals that can be like ticked off, like actionable goals. Um, so I think it's just self-awareness on why do I just want to talk. I'm so glad you mentioned the word dialogue because as a communication major I have actively avoided intergroup dialogue because I cannot stand talking. I do not like to debate or discuss the humanity of other human beings or myself. Um, so a lot of times that dialogue can take a deep dive into things that should not be debated. You should not debate whether or not I was three-fifths of a human at one point. Um, you should not debate whether or not LGBT students are acts of sin. Um, you shouldn't debate whether or not immigrants should be in this country. Um, that's, that's the livelihood of a person. There's humanity behind that. There's humanity in that. Um, like Kathleen said, dialogue tends to put a pause on things, especially here. And if we have that dialogue, it definitely needs to follow up with action steps. And then those action steps need to happen immediately. Otherwise, they get lost in the fluff, and then you end up talking about living in Oakland and all this other stuff. And it just ends up in a, a whole a megalomation of, we're trying to divert the plan. We're trying to divert you around. We got the runaround trying to get the multicultural lounge for three months, when it could have taken three weeks. We were put in conference rooms and conversations that had absolutely nothing to do with the fact that you take a sign off that door and put it on that one. So. Hi again. 
I'm sorry, I tend to participate a little bit too much. But um, real quick, <laughs> uh, out of respect to what? I got you. TT, wait a Just out of respect for my parents, um, I have revoked uh, a lot of my positions in student activism. Just because when I came here and I saw my financial aid package and all uh, the money that Hope College was giving me for the, my education here at Hope, I didn't know it could, use, could be used against me. Um, I was part, I was a very uh, loud part of 95 Stories my freshman year, last year, uh, here at Hope. And I worked side by side with uh, the founders of uh, this uh, student activism. Um, but because I started uh, hearing uh, a lot of students and uh, to some extent even faculty members telling me, you better watch out what you say, what you do, who you hang around with. Don't associate with some people because it's not going to look good. And once I started hearing that, you know, and I, as I talked to my parents a lot, they even told me, well, you know, uh, we love you and we support everything you do when we understand the unfairness of the world, but um, they told me, you know, it's, it's, uh, we can't afford you not being there. So um, some advice or some, um, uh, just any piece of advice you, you're able to give students that are afraid to, to um, be activists. Mm -hmm. So what I hear you saying is talking about how the fact that you have so much scholarship and that's the reason that you're here almost feels like a, a, pow like a power dynamic. It is a power dynamic and that you feel like you can't really rock the boat too much without worrying about the repercussions that may ensue from that fact that there is such a big pull on finances. Anyone have any comments? Johnny, what's up, man? That's, hey, a, great, that's a great point. Uh, I'm in the exact same situation that you are, man. Like, I'm here because Hope was able to give me a phenomenal financial aid package, and I'm super grateful for that. Any piece of advice that I've tried, like, I steer away from specific uh, leadership organizations on campus. Um, but I would tell you, and to any student of color, any marginalized student who wants to try to be a leader, get in a leadership position, two things. Number one, you don't need a leadership position to be a leader. Right. That's it's a big point you know and the second thing is do not be afraid find ways to make ripples because ripples expand and it's as simple as that you know like you I, I've tried to find my own ways that fit in my own schedule my own time to try to make change in the best way I can and I understand that like I'm on a scholarship I sometimes feel like if I say the wrong thing right who knows next semester you know like those are the, those are the sorts of things you know and uh, but at that same point I reflect on what I'm actually doing and I say, hey, if I leave, I went out fighting. Right. I went out trying to bring some change right. from what I believe in, what my values are, and what I was raised to think. So that's my advice to you. To add to Michael's point, the financial aid package is the sole reason I'm here. Um, and that has sparked a sort of inspiration in me, having been here for so long and been so involved with VSU. This is coming from a place of love. I don't hate this institution, I don't hate the people here. I love it, and I want to see it do better. I want to see it be its best. And once you frame it like that, it's kind of hard for people to come at you. It's kind of hard for people to say, oh, it's what you make of it. Oh, just be grateful. I am grateful, I'm beyond grateful for the people that I've met, for the experiences that I've had. I love being here, and I want to see it be better for everybody that I've met who's coming after me. I don't want the freshmen that I've met to have to struggle the same way I did for four years and feel like maybe it's not so bad if I transfer my second semester of senior year. I thought that documentary I made was gonna get me kicked out. But then I reframed it in my mind and brought it from a place of love. I want these stories to be shared because we don't hate this campus. Everybody in that room, I could say to an extent, loves being with the people they have here. And the fact that anybody could take that as anything other than that, as Elena would say in the video, um, it's a, you, you criticize the things you love. You can't fully love something without ever criticizing it at least once. And that's what we're doing. We're criticizing the institution because we want to see it be its best. Mm -hmm. And with that, I think... Oh, no.
<laughs> okay, Margo says one last question, yes. so you get this question. This will be very quick. Hi, I'm Ty Rip. <clears throat> to respond to the question about change that was um, said earlier, every person on that stage is tired. I'm tired of listening to it. Hold your white friends accountable. Please, like the white friends that Ooh. you buddy buddy with, that you go to belts with, that you eat with, that you know, you breathe with, like, hold them. <laughs> Hold them more accountable, y'all. Like, seriously, on a real note, like, we are so tired of sending this same message, message. And like Rebecca said, we're tired of talking about it. Like, your white friends have the privilege and power to do something. And I talked to a good amount of white kids on this campus who I would have never thought was, were as socially aware as they are, but they don't come, they don't show out, they don't do anything to support us. Hold your white friends accountable. My white friends sit right here is an advocate for immigrants and works her ass off every single day. Hold your white friends accountable. And that's it, and that's all. We can go home. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Gigi, for bringing up that, that very valid point. Um, if you've taken American Ethnic Studies with Dr. Cho, he brings up the concept of race being a moving walkway, which is something we look at in one of the books. I think it's Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Um, and we encounter on this campus a lot of passive races. You are standing on the moving walkway, and it's moving in the up, it's moving in the wrong direction. And there are people on this end running full force against that moving walkway, and we are exhausted. Yeah. We are tired. I have been told by three separate people that I am wasting away. Mm -hmm. Don't stand on the moving walkway. Run the opposite direction. Because I guarantee you there are twice as many people as us running in the wrong direction, making it a whole lot harder for us to counteract everything that's going on. And just um, one more question. Right. Um, so, hi everybody, I'm Devante. Um, so, for me, I just had a question really about like how you guys feel about the human sexuality statement that's currently on the... Um, Oh, because one of the things that I realized that Hope is an RCA affiliated school. Um, however, R the RCA doesn't really have an official stance on sexuality. And right down the street, there's a church, Hope Church, which is very affirming. <laughs> and so to see the two different reactions to like do this in the LGBT community is a little concerning for me right now. So what I hear you saying is that um, maybe I'm paraphrasing a little bit and adding it sometimes, but also a common excuse about like why our hope sexuality statement is the way it is is because we're RCA affiliated. But you've noticed that other RCA churches have been very affirming of LGBTQ students and, and people, and so like that's kind of like examining that um, inconsistency. Yeah, but also the RCA doesn't have an official stance. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I think that we recognize that there's a lot of different ways of being a Christian. There's a lot of different denominations that we recognize and that we celebrate and that we consider valid. And I think that there is affirming theology and there is not affirming theology. And if we believe that the most important thing about being a Christian is believing in Jesus and believing in who he is and what he's done for us, I think that other things should, that we should affirm students who choose to walk out their faith in that way and who feel that their sexuality is valid and that God is approving of that. Like, there's so many different ways to walk out your faith that I think that our statements should represent our students and our students' voices and our students' values, not just what a very small, very not diverse group of people decided. So I think, yeah, I don't really have more concise thoughts on that. Um, this is something that personally affects me and that I think I would like to see Hope be a space where, as part of the non-discrimination statement, it says that you cannot discriminate me for my sexuality, for the way that I, because currently the statement says sex. That can be interpreted as a lot of things. It can also be not interpreted as a lot of things. So does that mean you can't tell me that I can't be in a project because I'm a woman? but you can tell me that I can't be in a certain position because of my sexuality. You know what I mean? Like, I think we need to take specific, tangible steps towards making sure that everybody's included and everybody's faith, regardless of what that, the nuance of that faith is, is validated. I don't know if anybody wants to. Um, earlier you mentioned that it says that hope is committed to the idea of, what is it? 
the concept of equal rights. Hope is committed to the idea of the con hope is committed to the concept of equal rights. There we go. All right. Um, the fact that equal rights is a concept, to the fact that it says um, we the people are supposed to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Granted, when it was written, it didn't include everybody. Um, the fact that you are taking this overarching idea and enforcing it as the school's truth when there are so many people on this campus who live the exact opposite of that truth and live and work and walk in the light of God. That is amazing to me that you could so boldly say, we support the concept of equal rights, but don't, don't wave your rainbow flags too high now. Keep them, keep them low to the ground, keep them under the radar. Keep them in caps where the LGBT group is considered a support group. The group that is meant to represent LGBT students as well as straight students, students with varying gender identities and sexual orientations, seems to pretty much boil down to all sexualities matter. The fact that they, these students don't have a space where they can actively come and publicly support one another and be there for one another and care for one another in the same ways that the multicultural student organizations do is wrong. Flat, point blank, period. The statement is trash. It needs to go, regardless of the money that'll leave with it. And that's it. And like what Kendall brought up is something I want to amplify. It's like, regardless of your um, the reason that it is there is because of the power and the money of the people who want it there. It's about the board, it's about the trustees, and that's true with everything that's happening in Hope System. It is a reflection of where the money is coming from and what the power is. And what we're talking about is those same voices that have made that policy and that have kept us from including it in um, protected identities are the same voices that are making it so that students of color do not feel safe on campus. It's the same system. Um, they're not separate, and I love that we've included that as an intersectionality because it, it, the reason it's there, we're not talking about like whether this person disagrees or person disagrees, it's people with power have a certain opinion on that, and they don't think it's valid. So um, just keep that in mind that this is systematic, it's not just individuals, that this is systematic change.